my loves, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy. Welcome back to... Uh, what number are we on now? We are on book... Uh, I can't remember what number the book is, to be perfectly honest. It is Nemesis. Um, comes directly after A Thousand Sons and is sandwiched between the first heretic. Now, that should tell you something about this book. It should tell you something about the status of this book. It's sandwiched between A Thousand Sons by Graham McNeil and The First Heretic by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Both of those books are not only essential, you have to read those books in order to understand the overall plot of the Horus Heresy. They're also some of the best books in the series. Some of the very best books. As as you know from my um my gushing over a thousand suns last time round that is one of the best books in the entire series the first heretic i would argue is probably the linchpin the first heretic is the book that really tells you what is happening why it's happening the very basis of the heresy is in this book nemesis Nemesis I feel a little bit sorry for, to be honest, because it's because it's sandwiched in between those two, it tends to get lost. It tends to just be forgotten. Um, and in fact, I forgot it, because I'll tell you what, I, I cannot remember a thing from first reading this book. Uh, I cannot remember a damn thing. And in this instance, I mean, I can see why. I can definitely see why. It's not a bad book. There's nothing particularly wrong with it as such. It's just not, it doesn't have the same gravitas, it doesn't have the same significance, it doesn't have the weight of A Thousand Sons or The First Heretic. So it is one you can skip over. It really is. You don't need to read this book. And there are a few books like this in the Horus Heresy series, to be perfectly honest, um, as a way of sort of not just expanding the universe, but really just expanding the book series so that there are there's just more books out there. There are a couple of redundancies, like Battle for the Abyss, for example, which is totally not only redundant, but awful. I mean, Battle for the Abyss is a terrible book. Nemesis is... A sort of nothing. It does a few interesting things. For example, this book establishes something new. It establishes that what would eventually become the Assassin Temples are in operation at this point in Imperial history. Now, that was never the case before. The Assassin Temples, in the traditional background of Warhammer 40,000, were established much later. In this book, they're not temples yet. They're households. They're clades. And they have been... They've been around for a long time. There is some suggestion that these assassin households have been around since, like, prehistory. You know, they're ancient. They're, they are absolutely ancient establishments in human history. They're kind of like the Illuminati. They've been manipulating events and you know, manipulating the rise and fall of civilizations of, and so on and so forth for centuries. They are sort of what's behind the, the facade of politics and kingdoms and nations and whatnot. And that's what they're doing here. They are totally sworn to the service of the Emperor. Um, they're, they're entirely loyal. They really are. And what this book establishes, of course, is that every single one of the established households, and there are a lot more than the temples that you find in the present day Imperium, a lot more. I think there's 12 altogether. There are 12 assassin households, all of which have slightly different modus operandi and aspects, like the first one you encounter. He's trying to poison and Horus, basically, and he's been, he has been uh, wheedling his way into the um, the crews of the Traitor Legions for decades, trying to find a spot, a place from which he can actually attack the War Master. And there have been several attempts by several different households, all of which have failed. None of them have even gotten close to Horus, and that's largely due to the input of Erebus, by all accounts. It's largely due to um, the Word Bearers, because Erebus is protecting the War Master. And because he is sort of divining the future, he's reading the various paths and strands of probability in the entrails of his victims and whatnot, and in the tides of the warp, he knows when there's an assassin around. He knows when there's going to be an attempt on the War Master's life. So... 
really they are they're banging their heads against a brick wall they are really trying to get close to the war master even to his officers and it isn't working it really isn't working so it's interesting it's interesting to see the assassins in operation at this point in time because that was never a thing before this book also goes into a little bit more detail on what is happening in the cultures of the imperium like how the distinct and isolated worlds of the imperium are are reacting to the fact of the uh, the Horus Heresy, of the fact of this schism and this uh, burgeoning war, you actually see what people are thinking, what um, what propaganda is being put about from both sides, how people are regarding the politics of the war. And that's really interesting because for a lot of people it's a very distant thing. It's like something you'd read about in the newspapers in a, a foreign country or something. It's very, very divorced from waking reality um, until it arrives at their doorstep, until like a neighbouring world declares for Horus. And then suddenly, these cultures are forced to make their own decision one way or the other. They have to declare either for Horus or for the Emperor. And it shows you how the Imperium is treating these worlds, um, where there is even the suspicion that they might declare for Horus. And that's interesting. I like all of that stuff. But the, the raw fact of the matter is, this is one of those self-contained stories where it's fine there is absolutely nothing wrong with it unlike say battle for the abyss which is actively a terrible book this is fine there's absolutely nothing wrong with it the characters are cool and interesting the the story is fairly well composed and written um there's nothing like offensively bad about the writing or anything like that um what i would say is it lacks focus like a lot of the horus heresy books a lot of the ones that don't really succeed it lacks focus whereas in say a thousand and sons you have this close focus on very particular characters and it follows their story arcs and allows them to intertwine naturally this one has lots of different story arcs occurring at once which never really twine together a lot of them are kind of redundant it's a fluff book really it's about it's about giving you a little bit more background on what is happening in the wider imperium and in that regard is largely redundant it's something you can just throw aside and it's 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 a shame it's not really this book's fault it's just the fact of its placing and the fact that it doesn't really have it doesn't really have the intrigue that a lot of the other stories have because most of the characters who are involved here are characters you don't really know they just they're new for this book and they go away with this book as well they're not really mentioned again in the rest of the Horus Heresy. So it's kind of, it's self-contained, it's kind of redundant. If you want to skip over it, I would suggest doing so. Go straight from A Thousand Sons to The First Heretic, which I may have done first time round, to be honest. I can't rightly remember. Um, because this one, you won't be missing anything. There, were, you, there is nothing that you need to know here. Because the assassin clades just don't turn up again. They're just not that significant. I mean, there's a couple of things. You learn that Malkador is the, the master of assassins. He is actually the one who has veto over the... Because they're largely independent. They're rather interesting. They are largely independent, the assassin clades. They can, they can embark on operations according to their own discretion um, without any remit from the wider Imperium. Uh, Malkador is the head of them, and he has the power of veto. He's the high assassin. Um... And you learn a little bit about how that's causing tension within the wider politics of the Imperium, because there are members of the Imperium who find that form of warfare icky. They find it dishonourable. Um, they find it politicking. People like Constantine Valdor, for example, the um, the the head of the Adeptus Custodes, and um, Lehman, uh, not Lehman Russ, uh, Rogel Dorn doesn't like it either. He finds this form of warfare problematic very problematic and it shows you how there are parts of the imperial war machine that are secluded from the others like it's a case of he doesn't have to know and he shouldn't know so that's interesting the political intrigues are interesting but beyond that it's not going to set the world alight, this one. This one is not one of those books that sort of makes you gasp and sort of draw back from the page because something really significant has happened. It just isn't that book. It's, it's not, it, it doesn't even try to be that book. It's a kind of popcorn book in between these two big, weighty, significant tomes. Um, but the next one, 
the next one we're going to look at. I'm going to try and get some guests on for the next book because the next book is the book. The First Heretic is the book that it defines everything about the heresy. It completely upturns the word bearers and what they what people presume they're about and it goes deep 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 into the metaphysics of chaos and of the wider 40k universe it's really interesting it's a wonderful book um and it de- it definitely deserves a little bit more time and attention than most of the others so ladies and gents when we come back we will take a look at the first heretic until then bye bye Ha 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 